This is ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Vic Carson, Johnny. State Unity Life. Oh, what's in your mind, Vic? Got a job for you if you're interested. I just received a report from our agent in Venice. That... Venice? Oh, I'd love it. Soft nights along the canals. Venice, California, Johnny. Uh, okay, what is it? Murder. Bernard Slade, age 56, Penny Arcade operator in Ocean Park. That's right... Right next door to Venice. Go on. Well, the body was found in living quarters at the rear of an arcade in the amusement zone. Killer unknown. And? Barney Slade must have been quite a movie fan. The police found his apartment plastered with photographs of the movie greats. Silent screen vintage, that is. At least a dozen of them were of Mavis Gale, a real queen in her day. Yeah, the vamp type, I know. Oh? Oh, it's just a vague recollection, you understand. Yeah. Well, the police also reported that somebody, the killer probably, had drawn a big question mark in red crayon over each of Mavis Gale's photographs. Interesting, if it means anything. We think it does, Johnny, especially since Mavis Gale is named as the beneficiary in Bernard Slade's insurance policy. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Silent Queen matter. Expense account item one, $210.65. Plane, cab, fare, and incidentals to Ocean Park, California. As soon as I checked in at my hotel, I got in touch with Homicide. Sergeant McKay, they said, would probably be down at the pier. I saved you cab fare on this one, Vic. It was a beautiful moonlit night at the beach. A warm breeze was blowing in from the Pacific. And besides, it was only a three-minute walk from my hotel to the fun zone. A gaudy array of neon and noise. An occasional whiff of salt air seeping through the aromatic blend of fried shrimp, hamburgers, and popcorn. Business was good, and the Penny Arcade had its share. I headed straight for the blonde sitting in the change booth. She looked tired and faded. Hi, let me have a dime's worth of pennies, will you? Uh, real plunger, huh? Oh, money means nothing to me. Well, here you are. Don't spend them all in one place. Well, you know, I might at that. This machine here looks mighty interesting. Lola the farmer's daughter. Oh, it's kind of racy. How's your blood pressure? Fine. Then try uh, that row along the wall over there. Uh-uh, that wouldn't do. How could we carry on a conversation if I was on the other side of the room? Who wants conversation? I do. Uh, you don't look like the lonely type. Never can tell, though, can you? Look, you run along while I finish stacking these pennies, huh? No, seriously, uh, all I want is a few answers. Well, I got more than a few, honey. What's on your mind? Barney Slade. What about Barney? You work for him long? Who wants to know? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. I'd appreciate any information you can give me. Hey, your company dropped a bundle on Barney, huh? Well, that remains to be seen. Oh, Barney was a nice guy. Nice as they come. What do you want to know? Oh, we'll just start anywhere. You want to know about his friends? <laughs> well, maybe after what happened to him, you'd better tell me about his enemies. He didn't have none. Not one. Oh, must have been quite a fellow. He was, mister. Okay, let's get back to his friends then. <laughs> just about everybody along the pier. Anyone in particular? Oh, Frank Jessup, for one, runs a concession just down the way. Go on. Uh, Sam Hegstrom owns a fishing boat. Then there's, uh, Gus Kanakos, Irv Goldstein. Like I said, Barney had a lot of friends. Including you? Including me. How about Mavis Gale? I don't know the day. Well, she, uh, she used to be in the movies. Uh, the silent kind. Oh, I heard about her. Only I never met her. Didn't she ever come around? I never saw her. Did Barney ever talk about her? Not to me, he didn't. Why? Why what? Why should Barney talk about Mavis Gale? Oh, I, I just thought he might have mentioned her sometime or other. Uh, is that the door to Barney's apartment back there? Yeah, that's right. Mind if I have a look around? That'd be up to Sergeant McKay. Well, look, if he comes in, tell him where I am, will you? Tell him yourself. He's back there in Barney's apartment now. 
I walked on back and took note of the heavy padlock dangling open on the door leading into Barney Slade's apartment. The small living room was empty, yet it was crowded, too. Crowded with memories of the silent greats. Nazimova, Valentino, Pickford, and Fairbanks, me and Swanson, the Gish girls, Lawn Cheney, and oh, dozens more. Their photographs filling practically every inch of wall space. Mavis Gale was there, too, a big question mark in red crayon drawn over each of her photos. I moved through a narrow kitchen. The back door was wide open. I stepped outside. Who are you? Oh, Johnny Dollar. You must be Sergeant McKay. That's right. Yeah, your office said you'd be here browsing around. So I'm browsing. There's something bothering you, Sergeant? Murder always bothers me. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like those photos in there of Mavis Gale and the question marks on all of them. And that bothers me. You think the killer did it? Could be. Let's go back inside. Come on. Or maybe Barney, huh? Maybe Barney what? I'm talking about the question marks. Could be. Pictures belong to him. Yeah. Yeah, he had quite a gallery here. Looks to me, though, that some are missing. That's so? <laughs> Why, well, you know so, Sergeant. The wallpaper isn't faded as badly where they used to be. And there are a lot of tack marks, too. Okay, so who took them down? Barney? He could have. So could the killer. That's right. Have you found anybody who could tell you anything about him? The missing photographs? Not yet. Hey, Barney, keep a lot of money in here. Twyla didn't seem to think so. Twyla? Twyla James. Blonde out front at the change booth. Oh, yeah. Barney was sort of particular about his apartment. Never let anybody in, as far as she knows. Not even his friends. Huh. Wonder why. According to Twyla, he seldom used the arcade entrance. Preferred to use the back door. Is that the one the killer used? It was standing wide open when the body was found. Well, who found it, by the way? Twyla. When she showed up for work yesterday, the arcade was closed up, so she went around back. Do you know when Barney was killed? Doc figures around 3 a.m. Two slugs from a 38. One would have been enough. Any signs of a struggle? Yeah. Lamp over there was on the floor. That chair was turned over and this table had been upset. Pipes, medicine bottles, pill boxes scattered around. Uh-huh. Heavy bolt and chain on the inside of both doors. Barney didn't have to let a visitor in unless he wanted to. That's right. Of course, he could have run into the killer outside somewhere. Sure he could. Only you don't think so. Unless Barney was in the habit of walking in his sleep. Oh? Uh-huh. When we came in and found Barney, he was in pajamas and bathrobe. The wall bed over there had been pulled out and was mussed up. So it figures he was probably asleep when the killer tapped on his door. He got up and let him in. Yet according to Twyla... The place was off limits, even to his friends. But she wasn't around all the time and didn't know all his friends. He found some others? I'd like to find one of them in particular. A man Barney referred to as the preacher. Just the preacher? No name? No. At least Sam Hexton couldn't remember. And this uh, preacher, was he allowed into Barney's inner sanctum? Sam's pretty sure he saw the two of them come out the back door one night, a little more than a week ago. Other times, he spotted them taking a late evening stroll along the oceanfront walk. Mm-hmm. Did Sam ever talk with this preacher? No. But he got curious after a while, asked Barney about it. Barney said the man was a very old and dear friend. Let it go at that. And you haven't been able to find out anything more about him, huh? I'm still checking. Well, it would sure be a break if he could locate this preacher. He might be able to tell us something about those missing photographs, what they were. Might also explain why the killer took them. Have you seen enough in here, Dollar? Oh, yeah, sure, I guess so, Sergeant. Hey, tell me, what does Mavis Gale have to say about all this? I only got to talk with her just a couple hours ago when she returned from Palm Springs. She was pretty upset when I told her about the crayon marks on her photographs. Oh, but naturally she couldn't offer any explanation. None. How did she react to the news of Slade's death? Tears and such? She's supposed to weep about it? Why not? Barney Slade must have been a pretty good friend of hers. After all, he named her as the beneficiary in his insurance policy. Oh, that's interesting. Why? When I talked with Mavis Gale, she told me she never heard of Barney Slade. Expense account item two and three, one dollar and ten cents, phone call and cab fare. The call was to Mavis Gale's home in Bel Air. The butler said if it was important, I could find her at McCartney's Mortuary in Venice. Cab fare to Venice via what is laughingly called the Speedway, a one-way alley lined with backyards and garbage cans. It took us less than a minute to cross over into Venice, a boom that had busted. 
A melancholy mixture of old broken down buildings and the sound of the sea. Crumbling bridges, moss covered canals, of paved streets wandering disconsolately into sand dunes and ending where the money gave out. A dream that had kind of died of a broken heart. Good evening, sir. Oh, uh, Bernard Slade, please. Oh, yes. Mr. Slade is in the slumber room at the end of the hall. Is anyone with him? Oh, indeed. Quite a number of his friends. Would you know Mavis Gale if you saw her? The silent screen star. Oh, indeed I would. At least I think I would. She was one of my favorites. Oh, she, uh, she hasn't shown yet. But no, I, I... You mean she is expected? So I understand. Well, well, that's nice. Oh, that is nice. I didn't know she was a friend of Mr. Slade's. Oh, you know most of Barney's friends, huh? I know most of the people along the pier, and they were all his friends. Well, how about one called the Preacher? The Preacher? Mm -hmm. Well, naturally, I'm very well acquainted with many men of the cloth. And if you could tell me his name... I don't know it. Oh. Look, you have a visitor's register here, don't you? In each of the slumber rooms, yes. Just inside the door. Oh, thanks. Uh, oh, where did you say Mr. Slade was? Down the hall. Last room on the left. Yes. The room was crowded with friends who'd come to pay their respects to Bernard Slade. I eased over to the visitor's register and gave it a fast rundown. There was nothing to indicate that a minister was among the mourners present. But then I heard the hall door creak open. And there she was, Mavis Gale. Certainly not at all what I expected a vamp of the silent screen to look like 30 years later. Slender, trim, and a smartly tailored suit. And even more attractive than the photographs I'd seen of her in Barney's apartment. She moved down the center aisle to the casket and stood there for a moment. As I walked toward her, she suddenly turned, her eyes wide and staring, her lips moving silently. Then she crumbled to the floor. I understand you've been trying to reach me, Dollar. That's right, Sergeant. Okay, what's up? I got some news for you. Mavis Gale was once married to a small-time movie actor named Tom Sanford. Seems he was murdered during a hunting trip in the Sierra some 27 years ago. So? So now it turns out he wasn't. Mavis Gale just identified Barney Slade as Tom Sanford. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a stagecoach ride. I get some lumps, and a surprise witness turns up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Adrian John Doe, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. I understand you've been trying to get in touch with me, Dollar. That's right. Okay, what's up? I got some news for you, Sergeant. Mavis Gale was once married to a small-time movie actor named Tom Sanford. Seems he was murdered during a hunting trip in the Sierra some 27 years ago. So? Mavis Gale just identified Barney Slade as Tom Sanford. What? Same man, Sergeant. She's still at the mortuary? Yeah, the manager's office. I'll be over in five minutes. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Ocean Park, California... To State Unity Life Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silent Queen matter. Expense account continued. (music) Item four, ten cents, a cup of black coffee from Mavis Gale, queen of the silent flickers. While she drank it, I elbowed my way past Barney Slade's friends gathered in the hall just outside the mortuary office and walked out to the street to do a little quiet thinking. I didn't have time. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Oh, uh... Is it a fact, uh, about Mavis Gale, I mean, uh, she was Barney's wife? Well, where'd you pick that up? Well, Mort thought he heard her say so. Mort? A manager of the funeral parlor. You were in his office, helped carry Miss Gale there. Is it a fact, Mr. Dollar? How do you know my name? I was gabbing with Twyla earlier tonight. She's the girl at the change desk in the Penny Arcade. I know. Then I seen you and Sergeant McKay come out of Barney's apartment. Who are you? Uh, Frank Jessup. I run the mermaid bit over on the pier. You know, three baseballs for a quarter and you... You try to dunk the doll in the water tank, yeah. I uh, figure Mort heard right that Mavis Gale used to be Barney's wife. (sighs) Well, that's what the lady said. Uh, How do you like that? Old Barney married all this time into that Mavis Gale old-time movie star. Never breathed a word of it to any of us. (laughs) Sure can't get over it. And him being a picture player in the old days, too. Yeah. Do you recall ever seeing her around the arcade, Mr. Jessup? Nope. I think I would have recognized her tonight when she came in the mortuary. Real handsome woman. Can you think of anyone Barney might have told about his past? I don't think any of his friends knew, Mr. Dollar. Including Twilight James? Why do you ask that? Has she been with him long? Close to five years. What are you driving at, Mr. Dollar? Barney was still a pretty good-looking guy. She liked him a lot. And vice versa? Barney never talked it over with me. What did he talk about? Well, fishing mostly, and Pinochle. He was crazy about Pinochle. Best I ever played with. You play often? Average couple times a week. In Barney's apartment? Barney was kind of funny about that. None of us ever set foot in this place. Most of the time, we played over at my bungalow or on Sam's boat. I see. Say, uh, you being an insurance investigator and all, I was wondering, was Mavis Gale... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Jessup. This is Sergeant McKay. Well, you said five minutes, Sergeant. You made it to three. She's still in there, Dollar? Yeah. Nice turn out of Barney's friends. Only they're all out in the hall. Well, things got sort of frantic when Mavis took her nosedive. They wanted to find out why, I guess. Did they? Mm-hmm. Mort knows it around. Is he in the office with her? And a chauffeur. His name's Ronald. I'll send them both out. I want to talk to Mavis Gale alone. I don't think you get much out of her. She really fell apart at the seams. As it turned out, I was right. At least about McKay not getting much out of Mavis Gale. She came out of the office a minute or so later with McKay and the chauffeur on either side, and I went along with the mourners into the street. They helped her inside the big blue Cadillac, and she slumped down as far as she could get in the back seat, covered her face with a handkerchief. Then she was gone. Okay, you people, break it up. You came here to see Barney, remember? Sergeant. What is it, Dollar? Would you happen to remember Mavis Gale from the old days? When she was a star, I mean? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Was she a pretty good actress? I'd say she was. Do you think she still is? If you're referring to that fainting spell, Dollar, you tell me. You saw it. Uh, It looked pretty genuine. So? I just wondered is all. Just wondered. (laughs) 
Expense account items five and six, four dollars sixty cents, one morning newspaper and cab fare to Mavis Gale's Bel Air home. Now that Barney Slade had been identified as Tom Sanford, husband of the old time movie queen, the affair was splattered all over the front pages. There was also a complete account of the 27 year old murder case in which this same Tom Sanford had presumably been killed with a shotgun blast during a hunting trip. The big wide gates of the ex movie queen's estate were locked when I got there, but there was a phone close by. I picked it up, leaned on the buzzer. No answer. Nothing. Then I saw the car coming down the drive. I recognized Sergeant McKay at the wheel. Morning, Dollar. Hi. You have a special pass to this place? If you're figuring on having a talk with Mavis Gale, you better put it off. Doctor's orders. Still suffering from shock, huh? Yeah. And I figure she's leveling. Hmm. According to the newspaper, she and Tom had a pretty stormy time of it during their brief marriage. She was a star and he wasn't. Maybe that had something to do with it. She was also pretty popular in the film colony. Oh, Tom had a few buddies, too. At least four. The men who went on that hunting trip with him. The case was investigated pretty thoroughly. They came out of it clean. You know, it'd be interesting to find out who wanted Tom Sanford dead, though, wouldn't it? The fellow hunter who got his face blown off by a shotgun blast wanted Sanford dead. Only apparently Sanford beat him to the draw, right? Do you think somebody might have hired that would-be killer who instead became the victim? What are you getting at? So the person who did the hiring thought the mission accomplished, but then recently learned that Tom Sanford was still alive, posing as Barney Slade. <laughs> you really have an imagination. So this time he does the job himself. Or herself. It's possible. Look, I know Mavis Gale stands to collect 25000 insurance. Unless. Oh, sure, unless you can hang it on her. Two attempts on hubby Tom Sanford. I'm not trying to hang this on anybody, Sergeant. The insurance company hired me to turn in a report, and they'll pay off according to that report. I just want to be sure, that's all. Okay, relax. If you're going back to the beach, get in. Oh, thanks. Why do you think he did it, Sergeant? Why do I think who did what? Sanford. 27 years ago on a hunting trip. Why do you suppose he planted his identification and clothing on the man who tried to kill him and vanished? Who knows? Maybe he was in a jam. Like the idea of letting the world believe he was dead. And how about those question marks on Mavis Gale's photographs? A tie in there, maybe? We've been through that. Barney could have made those marks himself. Well, then here's a thought. Barney, or Sanford, whichever you want to call him, might have wondered, could his wife have hired the killer? And is that why he drew those question marks? I thought you decided the killer drew them. All right, assume the killer drew them. Why? You tell me. Well, it would certainly attract attention to Mavis Gale, wouldn't it? And the Eliminator is a possible suspect? As far as Barney Slade's death is concerned, yes. You're really determined to go after this woman, aren't you? Look, McKay, I told you... Okay, I'm... okay. Assuming the killer drew those question marks to direct attention to Mavis Gale, why would he want to do that? I can make a guess. Can't you? Yeah. Could be blackmail. But why wait all these years? For the simple reason he just picked up a little information recently. Maybe he got it from one of the men who were on that hunting trip. Think they're still around? Expense account item seven, $10.50, cab fare and tips. It took me that long to find Milo Martin, actor's agent, one of the men who had been on that hunting trip 27 years ago. He operated out of a plush suite of offices on the Sunset Strip. He wasn't in, but his secretary, a friendly and eager little doll named Lana, gave me a list of places where I might find him. I finally did. Out on a ranch near Chatsworth, where a movie company was filming an epic. Yep, I was him. What else? Milo Martin was short and round. He wore cowboy boots, dungarees, no shirt. He was sitting on a wide, flat rock, sunning himself. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. I read about it in the morning paper. It came as a tremendous shock. Tom, alive all these years? It's incredible. It's fantastic. Well, according to newspaper accounts, you were the one who first discovered the body that day 27 years ago. A horrible experience. Terrifying. and never forget it. We had been searching the hills all night, and then in the cold gray of dawn, there he was in the ravine. Tom. Only it wasn't Tom. But the police are certain. I mean to say... The that... scale positively identified the man known as Barney Slade to be Tom Sanford. Running a penny arcade in Ocean Park. It's incredible. Well, then who was the man I found in that ravine? We don't know. We may never know. And he wanted to kill Tom. But why? 
You have no idea why anyone would have wanted to do away with it? No, of course not. Oh, I knew Tom was a wild sort. He never got along with most people, but, well, to resort to murder. You were his agent, weren't you, Mr. Martin? Yes, yes, I was. I must confess I only took him on as a client to please Mavis. Oh, you also represented Miss Gale? I did. She was... Oh, she still is a truly wonderful person, Mr. Dollar. Uh Ah. I understand the two of them weren't getting along too well. Oh, that would be putting it mildly, Mr. Dollar. It was one frightful row after another, wild, hysterical sort of row. What did they quarrel about? Well, Tom was quite a gambler, and he also drank rather heavily, and he also fancied himself as quite a, a ladies' man. Oh, and this made her sore. He was also extremely jealous. Oh? Mavis ever give him good cause to be? No, of course not. Oh, he was always imagining all sorts of fantastic things about her. Actually, she was very much in love with him. That was my impression, at least. Tell me, Mr. Martin, those other men who were on the hunting trip, are they still around? Well, let me see now. There's Trev, for one. Uh, Uh, Trev, that's Francis Trevelyan, used to be Miss Gale's cameraman, independent producer now. His pictures aren't very good, but they make money. Well, how about this uh, Jarvis Pocket? Jarvis? Let me think now. Oh, excuse me. Are you ready, doll? Okay. That's Saul, the director. He's a friend of mine. Look, about Jarvis. You like stage coaches, Mr. Dollar? Well, I can take him or leave him. Look, what well, about Come along. This... They're finished up here. We'll ride the coach back to the ranch house. It's only a few miles, maybe five. And this contraption... Oh, you love it. All right, now, yeah. Get aboard, Mr. Dollar. Oh, brother. Hey, it's not too roomy, is it? Okay, doll. Let it go. Oh, yeah. hey, hey, hey. Oh. How do you like it, Mr. Dollar? I know how John Wayne feels. Uh, uh, let me see now. You you were asking about Jarvis Crockett. And that bastard dog. Oh. Back in there. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Expense account, item eight, 81 cents. One bottle of rubbing alcohol. It was late that afternoon when I got back to my hotel, but before I could use the alcohol on my aching bones, the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. McKay here. This time I got news for you, Dollar. You ought to be real pleased. Yeah, wait till I sit down. Oh, on second thought, maybe I won't. Okay, Sarge, let's have it. Mavis Gale said she didn't know her husband was alive all these years. That he was using the name Barney Slade, running that arcade in Ocean Park. So? So maybe she didn't tell us the truth. What do you mean? We got a witness, Dollar. Someone who saw Mavis Gale hanging around the Penny Arcade two nights before the murder. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bowl of lentil soup, and I almost wind up in a cemetery. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Adrian John Doe, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for Johnny Dollar. Hiya, boy, Vic Carson in Hartford. 
Say, things are really opening up out there on the coast, huh? So, you read the papers. Quite a surprise, learning that Mavis Gale was married to that penny arcade operator, Barney Slade. She'd been married to Tom Sanford. Sure, silent film actor. Only it turns out he and Slade are the same man. Really something, isn't it? Yeah, well... Here, Sanford's supposed to be dead for 27 years, and all the time he's living down there in Ocean Park, and she didn't know about it. So she said. Only somebody saw her hanging around the arcade two nights before Slade's murder, Vic. What? What does she have to say about that? She wasn't around when the police went out to her place a little while ago. No one knows where she is. Look, have you been able to get an angle on those photographs of hers in Slade's apartment? Why the killer drew those question marks over? No. And we haven't found out why the killer copped a half a dozen of the photos either. Photographs of who? How should I know? They're gone. Well, maybe they're important. No. Look, I'm on the trail of a character called the Preacher. If I find him, I may find some answers. Well, according to the papers... Johnny, are you sore about something? Yeah, Vic, I'm sore. Better read my report. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Ocean Park, California. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silent Queen matter. Expense account continued. (laughs) Item 9, 55 cents, one scotch and soda at a local pub. This was right after I talked with you, Vic. Yeah, I guess I was a little sore. Maybe it was because of that phone call earlier from Sergeant McKay. When he told me that old-time screen star Mavis Gale had been seen hanging around the arcade where Slade was murdered. Okay, so Mavis Gale was in line to receive $25,000 as the beneficiary of Slade's insurance policy. I suppose he figured I was itching to get something on her so the insurance company wouldn't have to pay off. I downed the rest of my drink and walked over to the Penny Arcade in the Ocean Park Amusement Zone. back again? Yeah, I'm back again, Twyla. If you're looking for Sergeant McKay, he's... You're sure about what you told him that you saw Mavis Gale in here several nights ago? I'm sure. Recognize her picture in the morning paper. Well, you didn't volunteer this information to McKay until this afternoon. I sleep late. Okay. So Tuesday night, Mavis Gale showed up around eight, she said. Well, I couldn't swear to the time. It, it was around then. Well, exactly what did she do? I told the sergeant. Well, tell me. When I first noticed her, she was standing just inside the front door, like maybe she was waiting for somebody. Was Barney here in the arcade at the time? No, Barney was back there at that test your strength machine. It was busted. And uh, I was up and fixed it. Oh, hiya, Mr. Jessup. Evening, Mr. Dollar. Evening, Twyla. Hi. Yeah, Mr. Dollar, Frank here's pretty good with electrical stuff. So? So I helped Barney fix the machine. Look, Twyla, I mean, what happened then? What did Mavis do? Well, she waited around another ten minutes, maybe, and then beat it. Did Barney see her? Did he, Frank? You mean Mavis Gale was in here the night he was fixing the machine? So Twyla says. Do you think he noticed her, Mr. Jessup? Kind of hard for me to say, Mr. Dollar. We were both pretty busy fooling with that machine. I didn't notice her, that's for sure. Look, Mr. Dollar, don't you believe I saw this Gale Dane here? You need half a dozen witnesses. Okay, Twyla, don't get excited. Uh, Twyla, what I come in for, me and Gus are going to drive over to the mortuary, spend a little time with Barney. I know you were there. Oh, yeah, that... sure. Sure, I- I'd like to go again, Frank. I'll get one of the boys to take over the change booth for an hour or so. Thanks. And be around eight. Well, I'll see you around. Uh, the... Just a minute, Mr. Jessup. I'd like to ask the two of you something. Sure, go ahead. I've got a list of names here. Barney may have mentioned any one of them to you. Now, stop me if he did. Milo Martin, George Sheldon, Jarvis Pocket. Stop. Huh? Yeah, Sergeant McKay already asked us. About that uh, fellow called the preacher, too. We've never heard of him. Okay. Thanks. I wandered around the pier for a while trying to figure out my next move. McKay wasn't around, and it was a cinch Mavis Gale hadn't returned to her Bel Air estate. So the only thing I could do was to keep on trying to track down the men who'd been on that hunting trip 27 years ago with Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade. 
Milo Martin, number one on the list, hadn't been able to give out with anything exciting. But he had given me a five-year-old address on George Sheldon, number two on the list. Expense account item 10, $15.10. Cab Baron tips on the trail of George Sheldon. It blew hot and cold until late that night when I wound up at a bar in downtown L.A. Yeah, old George worked here for a while. Handyman, sort of. That, that was I.W. Harper, you said? Right, it was sort of. So, you're an insurance investigator. Wouldn't be a cop, maybe, instead. No. Now about George. Just wondering is all, friend. What's he done you want him for? I'd just like to talk to him. You sure? I'm sure. It figures... He wouldn't be getting into no trouble. Real sweet fella. Real sweet for a fellow who had it rough. And believe me, he had it rough. Used to be an actor. Yeah, I know. Had it real good during the silence, you understand? Then along comes the talkies and old George. Him having a voice three tones higher than an air raid siren is out. Well, it happened to a lot of them. Only for old George, this, coming on top of a busted romance, this is too much. And he starts hitting the bottle and Wait a gets minute. down. What romance? Oh, movie actress. She up and married another guy. So her name wouldn't be Mavis Gale, would it? <laughs> Say, funny you ask that. Oh? Her name's all over the front pages. You read the story? Yeah, yeah, I did. You mean that this? Nah, nah. This wasn't the romance. Old George had a yen for some doll named uh, Josephine Hinch or something like that. Say, uh. You wanting to talk with him, it got something to do with that Penny Arcade murder? Yeah, that's right. Now, where can I find George Sheldon? Well, the address is 1712 South Glendale Avenue, Glendale. Thanks. Another drink? No, I'll finish this. And I'll be on my way. You know, I kind of miss old George since he left us. Yeah, sure. Real sweet fellow. Yeah, kind of miss old preacher, too. The way he used to rant and rave. What did you say? About the preacher? Yeah. Old guy. Was a friend of old George. He used to come in here and read him the riot act about his drinking. Wave his arms around and holler. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This preacher, what's his name? Mm-hmm. Let me see now. Kind of screwy name. I ought to remember. Runs a rescue mission somewhere around here. What a friend help. Sure. Your name's Pocket. Jarvis Pocket? Right on the button. Thanks. Here's your five bucks. My pleasure. Oh, and friend, since you've been so generous, well, that address I gave you on old George... What about it? Well, save yourself the trip. It's a cemetery. Old George has been dead for a couple of years. Jarvis Pocket had been number three on my list of the men who'd gone on that hunting trip 27 years ago when someone had tried to murder Tom Sanford but got killed instead. Now that it turned out he was also the preacher I'd been looking for, well, that could turn into a big break. Expense account items 11 and 12, $6 even, tipped to above-mentioned bartender and cab fare around L.A. Skid Row looking for the rescue mission. It was a neat-looking affair. All the lights in the main hall were on, and as usual, the place was open for business. Seek and you shall find... So, oh, my brother, seek you the way of the Lord, for along that way lies... There was a good crowd on hand. I eased into a seat alongside a bleary-eyed pilgrim who reeked of bad sherry. I looked around. The bottom of the barrel was here. The brothers were listening to the good man up front, but they weren't really tuned in. They were just waiting for a bowl of soup and a place to flop. Peace, my brothers. In him alone is your salvation and your hope of everlasting life. Open your hearts to eternal joy, and the glory shall be yours. We will now sing hymn number 32. When the singing was over, I got caught in the crush, and the next thing I knew, I was holding a bowl of lentil soup in my hand, and I realized I hadn't eaten all day. Meanwhile, I kept my eye on Brother Parkin and waited for a chance to get to him alone. That happened about five minutes later when he walked out. I followed him down a long, dark corridor and into his office. Please sit down, young man. Thanks. My name is Johnny Dollar, Brother Pocket. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. 
Frankly, I thought you were a policeman when I saw you out there seated with my flock. Been expecting the law? Yes. You... <clears throat> Excuse me. I knew they'd be coming around sooner or later regarding that long friendship of my old Barney Slade. Yeah, goes all the way back to the days he was known as Tom Sanford when you directed silent films. Check? Check. How long have you known Tom was alive, using the name of Slade? Oh, Mr. Dollar, I was witness to that horrible affair that took place during that hunting trip 27 years ago. Oh? Somehow, during the course of that day's hunt, I became separated from the others. Then suddenly I came upon Tom struggling with a man in a deep ravine. The would-be killer? The man with the shotgun? The other man fell, the gun went off, and he was killed instead of Tom. Go on, Brother Pocket. Well, immediately I told Tom we should find the others, tell them what had happened, that he would have none of it. Is that when he told you he preferred to let the world believe he was dead? And I suddenly realized it probably would be best for all concerned. In what way? Well, Mr. Dollar, Tom was constantly involved in trouble of some kind, drinking too much, gambling, women, brawling... He knew what it was all doing to Mavis, but he couldn't help himself. Believe me, Mr. Dollar, he loved her passionately. Made her life miserable, and his own as well. I see. Uh, Brother Pocket, about the would-be oh, killer. I, I know, I know what you're going to ask. The name of the man that tried to kill Tom. Yeah, you know him? Oh, yes. So did Tom. Only the two of us knew his identity. You're forgetting someone else. Mm hmm The person who hired him. Hired him? Oh, Mr. Darrow, what makes you think he was hired? So maybe I'm wrong. Am I? I was never quite certain myself. Did Tom think he was? Oh, no, 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 definitely no. At least as far as Mavis Gale was concerned. Yeah, quite right. Did you share his opinion, Brother Pocket? Uh, as I said before, I, I could never quite make up my mind. Oh, why not? Did you think Mavis Gale incapable of doing such a thing? Hiring someone to kill off Tom? No, I... I... I'd rather not say. Okay, okay. So who was the man who tried to murder Tom? What was his name? I'm afraid it'll mean little to you, Mr. Dollar. His name was Joe Fallon. Well, you're right. It means nothing. Well, this fact, however, might prove interesting to you. Joe Fallon, at one time, had been Mavis Gale's personal chauffeur. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, audience with a queen and a brush with a killer. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Adrian Jean Doe. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Oh, it's you. Hiya, Sergeant. Headquarters just gave me this number to call. I was wondering who'd be in Barney Slade's apartment. How'd you get in? With a key. Brother Pocket had it. Give me that again? Jarvis Pocket. 
He's one of the men on that hunting trip with Tom Sanford 27 years ago. He's here with me now. How'd he get it, the key? Barney had given it to him a few years back. He's known all along that Barney Slade and Tom Sanford were one and the same. He also knows the name of the man who tried to kill Sanford. Who was it? Name was Joe Fallon. At one time, he'd been Mavis Gale's private chauffeur. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Ocean Park, California. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silent Queen matter. Expense account continued. (laughs) Locating Brother Jarvis Pocket, who now ran a rescue mission along L.A.'s Skid Row, had been the only real break I'd had in the case so far. At least I hoped it would be. The one-time field director of the silent era had often visited with his old friend Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade, might put us on the track of Slade's killer. I watched Brother Pocket as he paced back and forth across the small room, scratching his chin thoughtfully, glancing up at the blank spaces on the wall where the photographs had been. He was still pacing the room when Sergeant McKay arrived. How about it, Mr. Pocket? As I told Mr. Dollar, Sergeant, I'm positive that this entire wall was covered with photographs. Uh Uh-huh. And now there are several missing. Were they photographs of some particular star? Oh, no, no. Action shots made during the filming of a picture that I directed for Miss Gale. Let me see, what was the title of that one? Well, maybe that isn't important, Brother Pocket. Oh, Who wait, was... wait a moment. I, 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 yes, uh, it was called Dangerous Little... No, Dangerous Lovers. Yeah. <laughs> that George Sheldon starred with Mavis in that one. Was Tom Sanford in it, too? Uh, oh, Tom, yes. Best role he ever had. Well, how about the next row of pictures? Mm, yes, well... A uh, uh, photograph of Mavis and Tom, I believe. I can't recall the title of that film. A dreadful thing. Francis Trevelyan talked them into it and directed it, too. And it should have stayed behind the camera where it belonged. And the bottom row, were they photographs of Tom Sanford and Mavis Gale? Uh, yes, yes, I'm certain of it. Uh, that picture was... Brother uh, Pocket, uh, would you say that Tom had changed much since those photographs were made? Well, not too much, no. He put on a bit of weight. His hair turned gray, of course, thinning on top. Oh, it grown a small mustache, too. How about it, Sergeant? You'll notice there isn't another photograph of Tom Sanford left on that wall. Okay. So assuming the killer took these away because they might identify Barney as Tom Sanford... And link him with Mavis Gale? Yes. Yet the killer went to the trouble of drawing red question marks over the other photographs of Mavis Gale. To deliberately draw attention to her. Why? Mavis Gale would have been involved anyway to a certain extent. After all, she is the beneficiary of Slade's insurance policy. Sure, sure. But suppose the killer wasn't aware of that. Uh, $25,000, I believe, is the amount. Yeah, that's right. And you're wondering why he did it. Oh, I can make a guess. You said he'd been pretty reckless, tossed a lot of Mavis Gale's money around in the old days. May have amounted to something close to 25000 Possibly. This may have been his way of scrying the account. 25000 bucks and a king-size shot. He could hardly be expected to guess that his death would come about under these circumstances, Mr. Dollar. No, no, but he could have passed away calmly in his sleep some night and wouldn't have changed a thing, Brother Pocket. Mavis Gale would still have been curious about a man named Barney Slade. Oh, yes, I suppose, yes. He must have been pretty sure she'd recognize him, that it would make a nice big splash in all the papers. Was he that much of a ham? Tom, uh, I'm afraid so. He couldn't have loved Mavis Gale very Oh, he, Mr. Dolly, right to the last, yes. Still, he couldn't resist the magnificent gesture, the big payoff, returning her 25000 You know something, Dollar? Now you sound like you're on her side. Yeah. Well, uh, gentlemen, if that's all that you want me for, I think I'd, I'd best be getting back to my quarters at the mission. The flock may be getting a little restless, huh? <laughs> you know how it is. There are times that... One of the brothers will sneak a bottle of sherry into the dormitory, and things become quite gay. (laughs) Sure, Mr. Pocket. You can run along, and uh, thanks. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Well, Sergeant, what's the next move? What about this Joe Fallon? You said he'd been Mavis Gale's chauffeur at one time. Yeah. 
Plunkett saw the whole thing, the attempt to kill Tom Sanford 27 years ago. Fallon and Sanford were struggling. A shot went off, and Fallon got it full in the face. Sanford then decided to play dead. Yep. But ever since then, Sanford was hiding out down here under the name of Barney Slade. That is, until somebody caught up to him, caught on to it three nights ago, and killed him. Big question still remains, who? Come on, let's get out of here. I'll get it. Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Right, I got it. That was headquarters. They just got a call from Francis Trevelyan. Trevelyan? He was one of the men on that hunting trip, along with Pocket and the others. Yeah. Seems Mavis Gale just heard we've been wanting to ask her some questions. She wants us to come right over. She's at Trevelyan's beach house in Malibu. The beach house turned out to be one of those super modern jobs, low, sprawling with a lot of glass and flagstone. The butler allowed us through the front door, and after a nice little stroll, we finally arrived at the den, a 50-footer at least, with a bar at one end. Mavis and a tall, distinguished-looking gentleman were at the other. Evening, Miss Gale. Good evening, Sergeant. I'm terribly sorry about all this. I didn't know you wanted to talk with me. I should have left word at the house, I suppose. But I was so upset, anxious to get away. I understand. Oh, this is Francis Trevelyan, Sergeant McKay and Mr... Dollar. We met at the funeral home. Oh, yes, I... I remember. Do sit down, gentlemen. May I offer you a drink? No, thanks, Mr. Trevelyan. Now, Miss Gale. Yes? When I first informed you of Barney Slade's death at the Penny Arcade at Ocean Park, you told me you never met the man. That's right. I had no way of knowing it was Tom. Not until last night when I went to the mortuary. Had you ever been in or near the Penny Arcade at any time, Miss Gale, previous to the murder? Yes. Two nights before. Why didn't you mention this to me when I spoke with you before? I don't know. I was frightened. A man named Barney Slade had been murdered. The killer had drawn question marks on my photographs in the dead man's apartment. Were you afraid to tell me because it would involve you deeper? Yes. I think that was the purpose of the phone call, Sergeant. What phone call? That evening, shortly after six, I received a call from a man. He wouldn't identify himself. He said that a very dear, very old friend of mine was in trouble and needed my help. He instructed you to go to the arcade in Ocean Park? I was to be there by eight o'clock, and this old friend was to make himself known to me. So you went. Did you see anyone? No one that I recognized. Miss Gale, does the name Joe Fallon mean anything to you? Fallon? Why do you ask that? Just a moment, Mr. Trevelyan. Why, yes. Joe was my chauffeur. Many, many years ago. And when did you discharge him? Shortly after my marriage to... to Tom. Did he tell you to get rid of Fallon? Yes. Yes, he didn't like Joe. Uh, Mr. Dollar, may I ask you why you're questioning Miss Gale about Joe Fallon? Because we just found out he's the man who tried to murder Tom Sanford 27 years ago. He was the man killed. The man we all thought was Tom. That's right. Was Joe Fallon in love with you? Now, see... Better answer. Was he, Miss Gale? I... I... I don't know. What are you two driving at, Sergeant? I I insist on knowing. And I'd like to know why you jump when I first mentioned Joe Fallon's name, Mr. Trevelyan. All right, all right, I'll tell you. You see, I'd, I'd quite forgotten about him... It was only when you asked Miss Gale that it, it suddenly dawned on me who he was, and it it startled me, because his name had been brought to my attention only some 24 hours ago. Oh? A, a phone call. A man who said he was in partnership with Joe Fallon. They had a business deal to talk over with me. And? Well, I simply told him that I wasn't interested. I was in the midst of my most important production, and I just couldn't be bothered. Did you receive a similar call, Miss Gale? I know. You know, Sergeant, I'll give you odds. It's the same one who called Miss Gale before the murder to get her down to the Penny Arcade. But I don't understand. Why? Who is the man? When we find that out, Miss Gale, we'll have the killer. Here's your hotel, Dollar. Oh, yeah, right. Thanks. Been a long day, hasn't it? Sure has. We haven't made much progress. At least Brother Pocket was some help. Uh-huh. Cigarette? 
Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, Pocket gave us a couple of answers. We could sure use a lot more. Thanks. You know, Sergeant, that bit about the photograph still bothers me. Why would the killer first try to hide the link between Mavis Gale and Tom Sanford and then deliberately draw attention to her? You think someone beside the killer could have made those question marks on her photographs? Could be. Okay. For instance... Who discovered the body? Twyla James. Okay. You mean she walks in, discovers the body, picks up red crayon, does the art job? Why? Well, look, I just make these things up. I don't explain them. (laughs) You're off the beam on this one, Johnny. When we got to Barney's place, she was shaking like a ship without a rudder. Ah, she was scared silly. Uh Uh-huh. I'd still like to ask her about it, though. Better get some sleep, Dollar. I guess. Thanks for the lift, Sergeant. Night. Yeah, the sergeant was probably right about Twyla. But I sauntered on down to the amusement zone anyway. It was late and the place was folding up. There was a nice warm breeze blowing in from the sea and the night was calm. So I continued along the ocean front, crossed over into Venice and kept right on going. The old canals and the bridges looked more sad and forlorn than ever in the pale moonlight, with the sea in the background adding its lonely rhythm of sound. The shot had come from somewhere over by the canals. Then I saw the man on the bridge staggering, weaving like a drunk. I headed toward him on the double. But before I could reach him, he stumbled and fell on his face. Here. Let's see how... Pocket. There. Back there. Pocket. This is Dollar. Johnny Dollar. There. Over there. He kept pointing across the canal, and then I saw the figure slinking away. I took after him. I scrambled across the bridge. And then along the canal. And then I lost him. I pulled up on the bank of the canal, looking around. Listen. Nothing. Then, suddenly, something. Footsteps behind me. But I heard them a second too late. Oh! Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a man who talked too much, and it killed him. Yeah, the payoff. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Adrian John Doe, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. This is Milo, remember? Oh, Milo Martin, the agent, yeah. Yes, I've just read about that terrible affair about Jarvis Pocket murdered. That was a terrible thing. Yeah, he didn't even make it to the hospital. And you, Mr. Dollar, the killer tried to do away with you, too, huh? All I got was a nice crack on the head and a not-so-nice dunking in the canal. Uh, You were fortunate, Mr. Dollar, extremely fortunate. Yeah, yeah. Anything else you wanted to talk about, Milo? Hmm? 
Oh, yes. I'm sorry I wasn't at the office when you called earlier. Well, your secretary gave me part of the information I was after. She remembered a man had phoned your office yesterday. Yes. She said he was a business associate of someone named Joseph Fallon. Well, I was, I was out at the time, but he did leave that message. Well, what I wanted to know is, did he ever call back? No. No, he didn't. He probably will. Unless he figures he's already found his pigeon. Pigeon? What for? Blackmail, Mr. Martin. Blackmail. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Ocean Park, California. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Silent Queen Matter. Expense account, final page. Twenty-seven years ago, somebody had hired one Joe Fallon to murder Tom Sanford, the husband of silent movie star Mavis Gale. But Joe had muffed the job. Now that somebody had turned killer himself. His first victim, Tom Sanford, who'd been going under the name of Barney Slade and running a penny arcade in Ocean Park. The second, Jarvis Pocket, who could have helped us spot the killer. The only two others who might help us were actor Francis Trevelyan and actor's agent Milo Martin. And both had received phone calls from the killer. The reason? Blackmail, obviously. Item 13, $1.35 cab fare to police headquarters. Morning, Sergeant. Hello, Dollar. How do you feel? Oh, okay, I think. You turn up anything on Pockets, Killer? Only this. Two slugs taken from the body, fired from a thirty-eight. From the same gun that killed Barney Slade? The same. Well, that figures. Oh, I wish a lot more, dude. Hey, look. Just what have we got, anyway? Maybe you better start with what we haven't got. Well, Barney Slade gets clobbered by a killer who scrawls question marks all over Mavis Gale's photographs in his dingy apartment. To draw attention to Mavis Gale. All right. Mavis is named as a beneficiary in Slade's insurance policy. Claims she doesn't know the man, then takes a look at his body and identifies it as husband Tom, who supposedly was killed 27 years ago on a hunting trip. Right. Then Jarvis Pocket, one of the men who'd been on that trip, fills us in with the info that Mavis Gale's ex-chauffeur had tried to knock off Tom. Yeah, but he goofed the job and got knocked off himself. Question. Had Joe Fallon been hired? Answer. Probably. Question, who hired him? (laughs) There's a beaut, huh? Say, this Milo Martin ever get in touch with you? Yeah, just before he came over. He got a call, all right, apparently from the same man who called Trevelyan. Mm Mm-hmm. Trying Fallon's name on for size. Oh, he's trying to get a reaction, that's for sure. And when he gets the right one, he'll put on the squeeze. I wonder why he didn't call Mavis Gale and give her the pitch. Maybe he did, and she uh, forgot to tell us about it. Think he called Jarvis Pocket? No, no, I think Pocket would have told us. I wonder if Pocket told us everything last night at Barney's place. Oh, probably not. I think he suspected something or someone. When he left us, he probably did a little prowling of his own. Result, got himself killed. Look, it's almost noon. Yeah, yeah. I'll buy you lunch. We'll have about an hour. Then what? Then I'm going to Tom Sanford's funeral. Aren't you? They buried Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade, that afternoon under cold gray skies that made it look like it would rain any minutes. But that didn't keep the crowd away. All Barney's friends from the pier were there, including Frank Jessup, who ran the mermaid bit, and Twyla James, who pushed pennies at the arcade. Mavis Gale, of course, was there, along with Francis Trevelyan and Milo Martin. And there were the usual spectators who came out of curiosity. When it was all over, the sergeant and I started down the hill. Hello there, sergeant. Mr. Dollar. Oh, hiya, Frank. Mr. Jessup. Sure it was a nice ceremony, wasn't it? Yeah, very nice. Pier was practically closed down. Everybody here for the funeral. Uh, we're all going to miss old Barney. Somehow, I just can't bring myself around to calling him Tom. Don't seem to fit somehow. Sure. Well, I, uh, I gotta get back to Twyla. She's taking this kind of hard. Oh, yeah, sure. 
I was kind of surprised the way Miss Gale stood up. Real brave she was. No tears at all. Yeah, I noticed that. Sergeant? Maybe she was all cried out, Dollar. It happens, you know. Uh huh. It happens. <laughs> I went back to my room at the hotel later that afternoon and stretched out on the bed to do a little thinking. Sleep, something I hadn't had much of in the past 24 hours, finally caught up. When I awoke, it was dark outside. After a shower and shave, I wandered on down to the amusement pier again. No particular reason. Then I remembered I still had the key to Barney's apartment. I flicked on the light switch in the living room and sat down. Then as I reached around for an ashtray on the small table close by, my sleeve brushed several medicine bottles to the floor. I was picking them up when somebody came in through the back door. Mr. Dollar? Oh. I happened to notice the light under the arcade door. What are you doing back here? Well, uh, nothing in particular, Twyla. uh, I'm afraid I accidentally knocked these off the table. Oh, no harm, I guess. Poor Barney won't be needing them anymore. Well, he had quite an array here. Medicine, pills. Yeah, Virus of some kind. Hit him like a ton of bricks a month or so ago. Oh? Did he go to the hospital? <laughs> no. Not Barney. He wouldn't hear of it. Well, who took care of him? Oh, Frank Jessup and myself. Between the two of us, we did the cooking and saw to it he got his medicine and all. Oh, wait a minute. I thought you said you'd never been in Barney's apartment. Yeah, that's right. First time was when I... I found the body. Well, look, if you and Frank took care of him while he was sick... Well, it was I... over at Frank's place in Venice. Oh. Yeah, nice. Barney and Frank and a couple other fellows were playing cards. Suddenly, Barney wasn't feeling so good, so he decided to lie down for a while. That's when the game broke up. Frank stayed with Barney, and when he saw how bad his fever was, he called Doc Ferris. Doc Ferris, huh? Yeah, lives over in Venice. Thanks, sweetheart. Lock up for me. <laughs> Expense account item 14, $1.50. Cab fare and tip to Doc Ferris's place in Venice. Barney, he told me, had been a pretty sick man, high fever, delirious at times. But Frank Jessup had stayed by his bedside during the crisis and had done a good job of nursing him through the night. Expense account item 15, $1.50, same care, back to the amusement zone. The attendant at the mermaid bit told me that Frank Jessup had gone home early. Expense account item 16, 75 cents, care fare to Frank's bungalow in Venice. place was dark. No answer. You looking for Mr. Jessup? Oh, yes, ma'am. You oh, know, you he know. just left a few minutes ago. Out for a walk, I guess. Oh, that's so? Uh, do you know which way you're headed? Down the street. That way. Good, thanks. I finally caught sight of him a couple of blocks later. He was headed south along a back street. I trailed him all the way out to 47th Avenue. Sand dunes, oil wells, a scattering of houses. Then I saw him duck into some shadows, so I waited. About ten minutes later, a big Cadillac came along, cruising slowly. As it reached the corner, someone inside flicked out a package, and then the car disappeared into the night. Frank Jessup suddenly darted out of the shadows, scooped up the package, and came running straight toward me. Hold it, Frank. What? I said, hold it. Let go. Let go. What are you doing here? I don't have to ask you that question, do I, Frank? And I don't have to guess what's in that pack. Let go! Not a chance. Uh, all right. Look, Dollar. We get a good thing here, maybe? We have. Sure. Sure, why not? 50-50. That the deal you offered to your old friend, Barney Slade? Look, look. I, I didn't want to kill him. Only when I went there the other night and told him what I had in mind, he... Well, he got sore. Started pushing me around. How did you find out about Barney's past? That time he was sick? Delirious? Fever make him do a lot of talking? That's right. So Barney spilled the whole thing without knowing. Come on, Dollar. Let's get out of here. Pocket guessed you were behind it all, didn't he? Figured that's exactly how you found out. So you had to get rid of him, too. Look, Dollar. Hold still, little pal. Now, who tossed out that package of money? Come on, Jessup. You called somebody on the phone and got a nice, fat reaction when you mentioned the name of Joe Fallon. Now, who is that somebody? I am, Mr. Dollar. Uh Uh-uh. Easy there. I'm a good shot. Well, well. The actor's friend and agent, Milo Martin. Thank you for holding our little friend here, Mr. Dollar. Makes things a lot easier. Huh? Your little friend was running a bluff on you, Martin. I don't think he's got the proof that you hired Joe Fallon 27 years ago. Oh, really? Perhaps not, but I couldn't risk it. Now, could I? So you thought you could make a little time with Mavis Gale if husband Tom was out of the way, that it? 
Yes, but I was wrong. Didn't even give you a tumble. Too bad, my lord. A stupid woman, really. is quite stupid. And now, little man... Look, Mr. Martin, we can forget all this. Don't be ridiculous. We can't. And by the way, we haven't met, have we? Allow me. Frank Jessup, he runs a stall down at the amusement center. Mr. Martin, you've got to trust me. I, I can keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I fully intend to make certain of that, Mr. Jessup. Look, all we're going to do is get rid of Dollar here. Oh, you're a sweet kid, aren't you? Nobody will ever know, Mr. Martin, I swear it. You're so right, little man. No one will ever know. Little Dollar! Hey! <laughs> Frank pulled away from me somehow and started racing across the sand dunes, but he didn't get very far. Milo Martin pumped two shots into his back. That meant he took his eyes off me for just a split second, and that's all I needed. I belted him where he was very, very soft, and then followed with a hard uppercut. Milo, 10% Martin, folded without a sound. 17th and final item on expense account, $185.10, hotel and incidentals in Ocean Park and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $436.25, end of accounts. Remarks about Frank Jessup. He got his out there in the sand dunes for the murders of Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade, and Jarvis Pocket. About Milo Martin, in jail, awaiting trial for murder of the above-mentioned F. Jessup. About Mavis Gale. She's going to see to it that the good work at Brother Pocket's rescue mission goes on. We'll donate $25,000 to the cause. <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. That'll be the insurance money. And the remarks and a report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star with a special announcement. Yes. I think you'll be glad to know that beginning Sunday, instead of five times a week, we'll be on the air only once a week, but with a complete half-hour story. Remember, that's beginning this coming Sunday. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. This week's story was written by Adrian John Doe. Heard in the cast were Paula Winslow, Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, Paul Dubov, Frank Gerstel, John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Chet Stratton. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Remember, we'll now be on the air on Sunday nights. The time will be listed in your newspaper with more exciting stories of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>